You're going to showboat, knock down the shot. For what his value is, it doesn't equate to winning basketball. When you're talking about the greatest of greats, that's what you have to do. You have to nitpick. We'll see you in the playoffs. We'll see you in the playoffs. Welcome, everybody, to this edition of the TMO Podcast. I am Jace Eustace, joined, as always, by my co-host, Jarrett Huff. Jarrett, whoa, my mic is on and doing something on its own there, man. Found a roll. It is, it is playoff time, man. We have just a couple more play-in games to go, and we'll get into that in a little bit uh, once we get to kind of where those matchups are going to fall. But for the most part, we have the playoff set. We have matchups set and on this podcast and every other uh, NBA media across the realm across the internet they're going to be breaking down the games and breaking down the series that's exactly what we're going to be doing on this podcast but how are you feeling right now my man i'm feeling good i mean this is the time of the year that we wait for every single year this is what everything all 82 games every team has played this is what it all mounts up to and i'm i just can't wait i can't wait to watch playoff basketball on a nearly nightly basis until june Oh, yeah. This, I mean, this we have been fortunate when we started this podcast at the beginning of last season. The playoffs we had last year were awesome. It was just crazy to see. It seemed like every matchup was – there wasn't one that you're like, oh, I don't want to check that one out. I already know who's going to win. It, you know, And this year, it's, it's shaping up like there's not going to be a lot of those series. Like I'm going to be keeping my eye on all these series. I'm going to be watching as many games as I possibly can. There's so many intriguing storylines that are going on in between all these games, between all these teams. Some of them have history. Some of them are just the team that no one expected to be there. And then the championship caliber team, it's all these these kind of storylines going through. But it's going to be interesting. We're going to go through every single matchup. And I thought, what better place to start going through these is over there in the East, where the East has been kind of locked up. It hasn't been as wild as <laughs> out West as far as what teams are going to be in there. But starting in the middle with our 4-5 matchup, we are getting the Cleveland Cavaliers taking on the New York Knicks. So when you kind of sat down and you looked at how this was going to play out, what's your kind of take on this matchup with the Cavs against the Knicks? Well, the X factor in this series is going to be whether Julius Randle is available or not. Um, As you know, he is injured right now, and I don't think there's a definite time when he's going to be back yet, at least nothing I've seen. Uh, So in my mind, it's going to be a relatively easier series for the Cavs. I still think it's going to be an interesting one because the Knicks have surprised everybody this year yeah. and they have a lot of players that could step up like Jalen Brunson and Emmanuel quickly. Uh, so it should be really interesting. Um, I'm still going to go with the Cavs. Even if Julius Randle's in this series, I think um, it wouldn't go beyond six games because this Cavs team is the best defensive team in the NBA. Yeah. And Donovan Mitchell has been fantastic. Probably the best acquisition all year um, outside of Jalen Brunson. Um, yeah. I, I think uh, this is going to be a, a good one for the Cavs on to the next round for the first time without yeah. LeBron James since the 1990s. Yeah. And that'll be huge for him, obviously. And you touched on their defense too. And it's sneaky. He's definitely getting some uh, defensive player of the year votes. And that's uh, Evan Mobley. He's been great mm-hmm. kind of in his second year. I think eventually he's going to take that step forward on the offensive side. He's still a pretty good offensive player, but he's just focused solely on the defensive side of things. And when you got Donovan Mitchell, you know, out there who's putting up, you know, sometimes 70 points in a game, you can focus a little bit more on the defensive end because you have guys that are going to go out there and put in buckets. So I think this matchup, I agree with you. I don't think it's going to be as close as a lot of people. And I'm just going to say Knicks fans think that this series is going to be. Um, Like you said, they're going to be starting this series without Julius Randle. Who knows when he's going to come back, what game, what how effective he's going to be when he comes back as far as coming off of an injury. Cavs are pretty nearly fully healthy. The only thing is Isaac Okoro is dealing with a little uh, with with an injury, but all of their main guys are going to be there. They're going to be in that lineup and they're going to be playing. And I think they're just a better team at this point. I don't think anybody's really arguing that. The one thing that could make this interesting is that Knicks kind of eight man rotation because in the playoffs we know these rotations they shrink. Where you know in the regular season you play you know ten deep, sometimes eleven deep with some of these teams. When you get to the playoffs, it's really about eight guys, sometimes nine, where those are really the only guys you're going to be seeing getting valuable minutes, not be playing mop up roles. So for the Knicks, you know those top eight they're used to playing a lot of minutes under Tom Thibodeau. So you talked about Emmanuel quickly, who put himself in that six man of the year conversation. So that's one thing that could make it interesting, just because they're kind of already in playoff mode. If you talk about their rotation and their minutes, if those guys got off the bench playing those high 
five minutes, but I just don't see a path for the Knicks to get the upset in this series. I don't see it at all. I'm going Cavs in five. I think the Knicks win one of those games in New York, but this is this is a quick series. I think the Cleveland Cavaliers are solely going to be in possession. It's never going to be in question. I could see you know the Knicks winning a game when Julius Randle comes back, but I think those first two games in Cleveland – like you said, Cleveland's going to have those home fans for, you know, in the playoffs, a chance to do something first time without LeBron. So it's been a few years. They're going to be rearing. They're going to be ready to go. They're going to take those first two games and I'm going Cavs in five in that series. So it's, I'm, I'm right there with you. I think you said five or six, well, six if Julius Randall possibly comes back and, and plays mm-hmm. really well, but I think we're both pretty much on the same page there. And sorry, Knicks fans. It's just, I, I don't see the upset. I know that they've, they've, been better than a lot of people thought this season. I give them massive credit for that. You know, being there in the five seed, that that's no small feat. But I think their season's going to come to the end against the Cleveland Cavaliers. Yeah. Uh, another nice little wrinkle is because the Knicks were in the Donovan Mitchell market ahead of yeah. the start of the season. <laughs> yeah. And it's crazy that yeah. that trade is going to be a factor um, oh, absolutely. in this series because obviously the Knicks lost out when they were the favorite and the Cavs came out of nowhere. Absolutely. So everyone was surprised and uh, snagged them. So. Well, absolutely. Nice and, little wrinkle there. And sometimes when you see that the player can kind of take a vendetta, but I don't think like Donovan Mitchell has anything negative about the, the oh, no. New York Knicks. I think if he got traded there, he would have loved to go there and play. But I think Donovan Mitchell is really happy where he's at right now. He's got a young team and he's kind of seen as that leader, which he should be going out there and putting up the numbers that he's putting up. So and I love I mean, Donovan Mitchell is in a situation now where the defense built around him, he can just focus on scoring. And that's mm-hmm. For a bucket getter, which is exactly what he is, what better position could you be in? It's like, man, we just want you to score. You could take shots, just go out there and get us points on the board. So that is another interesting thing I didn't think about, too. Just another one of those storylines in this matchup where the Knicks, a lot of Knicks fans, they wanted Donovan Mitchell. They ended up with Jalen Brunson, but I'm sure, you know, Jalen Brunson's been great this season. So, but, uh, but yeah, that'll be the first matchup. That's how we both got. Moving on here to our second matchup in the Eastern Conference. That's the Philadelphia Philadelphia 76ers against the Brooklyn Nets. What do you got going on in that series, man? Um, see, this is the one series I don't care too much about. Um, okay. I might watch Mikhail Bridges um, just to see like how Mikhail Bridges performs as a primary option. Yeah, yeah. But for me, the Sixers have been rolling um, this season. I don't think it's going to be much of a series at all. Um, this is probably the only sweep I have. Oh, the only okay. series I could see being a sweep. Yeah, yeah. I have the 76ers winning in four games. This Brooklyn team um, basically essentially inherited their record from KD and company yep. after they left town. So it's really not the same team as at all. They treaded water as best they could to get a playoff spot, avoiding the play-in tournament, which I was preying on them falling farther down the uh <laughs> Down the ladder, I'm so sure was I in Miami, too, man. We, just, we, just, we needed one more spot to get above that plan, man. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is this is a team that I just see kind of as cannon fodder for the seventy sixers <laughs> offense. Yeah, no, I'm with you. The seventy sixers, they've been great all season long in my eyes. You know, they they have the MVP of the league. They got solid role players surrounding him on the wing. They have, you know, he's past his prime, but they got a Hall of Fame point guard in James Harden. What does worry me most about them, and this will probably come into affects more in the later rounds than it's going to in that first round but it's the playoff history of Harden but even more so Doc Rivers in the playoffs where they don't necessarily have this track record of just being great in the playoffs and performing James Harden obviously more on the court and Doc Rivers it's more blowing 3-1 leads that's kind of what he's I mean at this at this point new NBA fan like we grew up or watching the NBA and Doc Rivers you know is winning a championship with the Boston Celtics but people that are younger than us, they're just going to look and see Doc Rivers blew a lot of 3 1 leads in the playoffs. Like, that's more what he's becoming known for. And it, it sucks because I think he's a great coach. He's been around for, for a long time. I think this is a chance to kind of get that monkey off his back a little bit and just go out there and perform in the playoffs with an MVP of the league. Joel Embiid, you know, he's never made a conference final. I cannot see Philly losing to an underwhelming Nets team in round one. I do love Mikel Bridges. I'm going to be interested to see. He's going to go out there. He's going to put up big numbers. I'm, I'm thinking Mikel's going to have a couple 35-point games mm-hmm. in this series. He's going to have to. But it's it's going to be all for naught because I think that defense is just too stout. Joel Embiid, they, they don't have anybody to match up down low with Joel Embiid. They don't have anybody to stop him. And then James Harden just kind of going to do what he wants on the perimeter. I, 
I could see this one being a sweep as well. I'm gonna I'm gonna say give me Philly in five. I think Brooklyn could take one of those games there in Brooklyn, game three or game four. You know, maybe the 76ers, they get control of this series, kind of take the foot off the gas a little bit and give up a game uh before kind of finishing this one off. So I'm right there with you. I don't think this is gonna be much of a series. The Nets, they inherited that record. Exactly. You nailed it on the head there. And just I think it's it's an interesting story going forward, what's going to become of that team and kind of the players and see if they're going to get an infusion of, of a possible star player moving forward. But this this year, cannon fodder. It's exactly what you said. You absolutely nailed it. So I'm right there with you with the Nets or with the 76ers over the Nets in four or five games. But moving on to our next matchup in the Eastern Conference, and that is the Boston Celtics against the Atlanta Hawks. And we both – Thought in our last podcast, we both were sure this was going to be the Celtics against the Miami Heat, but Miami Heat went up there and laid an egg in that playoff series. So we are getting the Boston Celtics against the Atlanta Hawks. What you got going down for this series? So I think this is the matchup the Celtics were praying for because, as you know, the past several years, Miami and Boston's met frequently. Absolutely. And they've been dogfights. So I think Boston's really happy not to see Miami. Um, but I still think, regardless, this is going to be an interesting, fiery series. As you know, Trey Young, um, wh- whatever he does, it's going to be there's going to be some controversy, or there's going to be some moments where you see him screaming at a coach, like he did against the Miami <laughs> Heat the other night, even though they were up big. Yeah, you're going to see him screaming at somebody, screaming at the refs, complaining about a call. So the series will have some draw for sure. Um, mm-hmm. but this Boston Celtics team is it's a complete team. Absolutely. And I honestly, I don't think um, Atlanta really has any chance here. I think they can steal a game. You know, Bogdan Bogdanovich was prone to having big nights to make up for some offense where you're typically not expecting it to be yeah. there. Like he'll drop 30 points. He'll be like, oh, that's who killed us tonight. <laughs> it yeah. was Bogdan. Because yeah. he's just hitting threes from anywhere he wants. Um, I think this Atlanta Hawks team has some fight in it, but. Um, this is another, I think, five. It could go to six, but I'm gonna I'm willing to bet five games. It's just Boston's such a great team. I mean, they have arguably the sixth man of the year in Malcolm Brogdon. Yep. Jason Tatum put up his best season of his career. Same with Jalen Brown. Yep. Um, this team is really firing on all cylinders, and I, I can't wait to see what this team does in the playoffs. I'm predicting a deep playoff from, run for them, and it starts going through Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would. If it was going to be Miami, I was really looking forward to seeing another matchup. Obviously, what they went through last season where, you know, everybody just talks about how the Celtics rolled through the the East, but it was not easy. You know, they had to go to game seven with Milwaukee. They had to go to game seven with Miami. And we talk about it all the time, but uh, Jimmy Butler missed three right there at the buzzer away from we were talking the Miami Heat were in the finals last year. So mm-hmm. th- it wasn't exactly easy for them. I think they are a great team. They're a very complete team. And I think they got better this coming from last season going into this season as well. Um, But I got to give Trey and the Hawks credit, man. They went out there, they're dealing with, you know, the trade rumors, all the criticism Um, for most players that would seem to be distracting, but like Trey, it seems like he relishes that controversy. Like it seems like the more talk that's going on around him, the more they win on the court, it's kind of opposite than what you'd like to see from your normal, you know, star player of a basketball team. And one interesting point, I wish I could remember who said it, but, and give them credit, but, You know, Trey Young, obviously, he's hated in uh, New York at the Boston Garden, what he was doing in the playoff series to them. It's kind of it's it's weird. We're going to now see him in Boston where I I don't think they're going to, you know, threaten to take the series at all. But we're going to have another kind of area that's going to learn to hate Trey Young. And he loves it. Without a doubt. He's going to play into it. And I'm just I'm picturing. Trey Young in the Boston Garden, you know, they say they're they're playing a game there and. In the third quarter, they go on a run and go up, you know, six or seven points on Boston, and he's feeding into it, and he's just getting booed. And, I mean, the Boston Garden, it can be brutal, man. So we're going to see another just kind of fan base learn to to hate Trey Young, and I think that's going to be interesting in that. But that being said, the Celtics, they have that offensive firepower. They got a defensive system. They're going to dismantle the Hawks. I think the controversy in my pick – is I'm going to say that the Celtics win in six. I'm going to give them two games because I think 
they can have a tendency to overlook an opponent for a game it's game or two a little bit where they kind of get unfocused on the defensive end and the, the Hawks have offensive players they can go out there they can put up points so I think they can steal a game or two I'm going to give them two because I think Trey in himself when he's being overlooked can steal a game and then those kind of other guys the Bogdans the Clint Capellas the the Johnson Murrays they can go out there and they can take another game so I'm going to say Boston in six it's not going to be as easy as Boston thinks it's going to be but they're going to be you know firmly in control of that series it's never going to be in doubt so I'm right there with you so far in the Eastern Conference but moving on to our last first round matchup that is that number one seed Milwaukee Bucks and the two be decided tonight by the time you guys hear this it'll already be decided but on this podcast we care about the playing game tonight. We got this Miami Heat hosting the Chicago Bulls. Win or go home. Winner becomes the eighth seed, and the loser is on the way to Cancun. And we will see which team will be playing on into the postseason. Two, let's just be honest, probably get dismantled by Milwaukee in the first round, but a chance to continue to watch us play some basketball. So who you got in that match? Well, first off, I don't even think I have to ask, but who do you have winning that matchup tonight? And then who do you have in the series, Milwaukee? Well, I'll start and I'll present my case. Okay. It's going to be the Chicago Bulls tonight, <laughs> okay. led by my main man, Zach Levine, number eight. I thought you were going to say um, my main man, Patrick Beverly, there for a second. I mean, he's going to be the spiritual leader, that's for sure, uh, or yeah. possibly the uh, full 94 feet leader. <laughs> but uh, no, the Chicago Bulls are going to take it home tonight, and here's why. We've had your number all okay. season long. We swept the season series. We yeah. feel pretty good about Miami this year. We didn't feel good about a lot of things this season. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a struggle for sure, but we didn't struggle against you. And we felt pretty good every time we faced you. We we come to play against the better teams for whatever reason. We just like playing down a competition. Well, we're not going to play down to you tonight. <laughs> we're going to be up most of the night. It's going to be a competitive oh, okay. game, I think, because Miami's going to be a little fired up from the loss they took oh, against yeah, Atlanta. Absolutely. But from what I've seen Miami... The team seems just kind of shot um, emotionally, physically. Um, Jimmy Butler is going to need to have a game tonight um, and maybe playing against his former team is going to get him a little fired up because after I feel like he still has a bit of his chip on his shoulder to the Bulls oh, organization. Yeah. Um, not so much the fans. He he loves us. He loves us. Yeah. And <laughs> Jimmy it's the organization. Jimmy, we still love you too, man. I was wearing this jersey during the game the other night to root for the Heat because I don't got a Heat jersey, mm -hmm. which I might have to get a Jimmy Butler like Miami Vice jersey. Those are nice. Those but are pretty nice. That's nice. my old school Butler jersey that uh, I pulled out of the closet because uh, I, I still got love for Jimmy. But uh, Jimmy, I'm sorry. You're going to have to lose tonight, man. You're going to have to lose. Yeah. Because the Chicago Bulls, let's face it, and we saw against Toronto – they get down, they can put up the fight to claw their way back. We got Alex Caruso and Pat Beverly playing defense on the perimeter that is yep. just suffocating. We have Zach Levine, who has been on a tear since the All-Star break, putting up 30 or 40 points a night, no problem. I, I mean, Zach Levine can get hot quick. You have yep. to guard the man, especially on the perimeter. I don't always love his shot selection, but then sometimes it goes in and you're like, all right, bye. I had no complaints there. Well, I, I wasn't about to say anything. <laughs> and um, DeMar DeRozan also, like this team underperformed all season. They want to get in the playoffs. They want to say, hey, we're, 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 we were supposed to be here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like you said, the Bulls, if they do make the playoffs, um, they're going to face against the Milwaukee Bucks, and I feel like they're la less equipped than last year to handle them. Um, maybe the Bulls can steal a game like we did last season, but <laughs> I went to one of those playoff games last year. It is yeah. not even a competition. There's no one to guard Giannis on the Yep. Even with Chris Middleton out, this Milwaukee team still formidable. You got one of the best perimeter defenders in the game in Drew Holiday. Yep. He's going to make life hell for Zach Levine. Yep. It's it's not going to be much of a challenge for Milwaukee. So either way, whatever team does roll into Milwaukee for game one and two, don't expect to leave with a win. Somehow the Bulls <laughs> did it last year, but don't expect it yeah. this year. Miami also watch out because I don't think Miami has anyone to guard Giannis either. Not having PJ yeah. Tucker this year is clearly yeah. hurt. The the closest one that they can throw at him is Bam. And Bam, you know, he's a great defender. He just doesn't have the size for, for Giannis. I, there's there's no one in the league that can just shut down Giannis like that. It's insane. But 
No, I obviously I disagree with you for the game tonight. The uh, Miami Heat are absolutely taking that game. And, you know, I love all the reasons that you said. And he, Zach Levine, he has been absolutely on a tear so far, you know, in the second half of the season. But I think Jimmy Butler is going to be guarding him primarily tonight. He's going to be all over him trying to make his life hell on the offensive end. And if there's no, one thing we know about Jimmy Butler, sometimes he might be off on the offensive side. He's never off on the defensive side of things. I think Miami – They are not going to go out there and lose two. They're not going to be that first team to, you know, lose those two games when you're the seven seed and get knocked out of the play-in tournament. It's not going to happen. It's not going to be Udonis Haslam's last game in the NBA. It's Jimmy Butler is not going to let that happen. Miami, he's not going to lose to his former team, a team that, you know, had to come back from down big to beat the Toronto Raptors in the game before. He's not going to let that happen. It's going to be one of those, he is willing you to victory games. Tyler Hero, he's been streaky all season. He is a streaky player. He's going to light it up a little bit from beyond the three-point line. Bam Adebayo got embarrassed by Clint Capella in that last game Clint Capella put up four points but just out rebounded him the entire night Bam has got to toughen up that was a wake-up call because you cannot let Clint Capella go out there and eat your lunch money like that it is not going to happen he's not going to let Vooch out rebound him in this game and continue those possessions so Miami Heat they're taking that game tonight they're going into that first or the first round matchup against Milwaukee and <clears throat> They are just not going to be ready for a first round matchup against Milwaukee. <laughs> That's the thing. just to make it short and sweet. No matter how well coached they are, no matter how defensive minded they are, Miami just doesn't have the scoring to compete with the big boys in the Eastern Conference this year. Jimmy's going to give you absolutely everything that he has, but bam, he can disappear for stretches. He can disappear for games. You cannot have that against an opponent like Milwaukee. Hero, I mentioned, he's streaky from beyond the arc. And Drew Holiday, one of the most underrated players in this league. I love Drew Holiday, what he gives you on both ends of the floor. He's going to have a field day with Gabe Vincent and Kyle Lowry. They're not going to be able to stand a chance in that backcourt. Give me the Bucks over Miami in five. I think Miami wins game three in Miami. You know, they go go down 2-0, come back, come back to Miami, the kind of the long play ride from, from uh, Wisconsin down there to Florida. Uh, they take game three. But this is it's not a series. You know, I'm going Milwaukee over Miami in five. And it was such a shame when it came to Kyle Lowry. He was like your only guy that night. Yeah. And that was possibly the last great Kyle Lowry game we're ever going to see. Yep. And no, he was Miami, great. And Miami still couldn't pull through. Oh, um, exactly. So you hate to see that. Um, but you know what's a nice little wrinkle to this game? Yeah. Uh, this game could once and for all decide, did the Bulls win the Jimmy Butler trade? Oh well, okay. We're talking we many got, we steps. Got, we got yeah, Zach Levine, but we're talking going against Jimmy steps. Butler tonight. Yeah, yeah. Which I ha- I think this is the first like playoff, somewhat relevant game. Yeah. It's not a playoff game, but like playoff atmosphere kind of game that the Bulls and Heat have played since. Um, I believe the the season Rose went down. Um, yeah, in the playoffs. Yeah, I think yeah. this is the, so. It's been like eleven years. Yeah, it's been a while, man. Yeah, but... we, we, I miss the Bulls Heat matchups that actually mattered. Yeah, those are a lot and of fun. Don't man. at the same time. <laughs> Miami, dude, they get in. They get in dog fights. That's that's the thing about them. They they grind out series. So, I think I think there there's no way they can lose tonight. Not at home. They're not losing two consecutive we'll home see. games. Not Jimmy buckets. It's not happening, man. But, ah. Uh, that that's going to be interesting. But moving on here to our Western Conference, the first matchup we have over there is those Phoenix Suns taking on the LA Clippers. What do you got going on in that matchup? Now this this is going to be a very fun series. I hope yeah. Paul George is going to be healthy because that's going to add another wrinkle to it. Um, because this is this is a star studded series, or at the very least, pretty star studded for the 2010s. Yeah. Um, I I wish this was a second round series. Honestly, it's just a shame that this. But that's the great thing about the Western Conference. Yeah, it is so they're all great. Even matches. all the teams are are good in their own ways, or all the teams have stars and stuff like that. This is going to be the most interesting first round in quite some time, I think. Um, and this match was part of it. Now the Clippers have struggled the last few months of the season, as you could tell after um, the buyout market and uh, trade deadlines passed. Um, uh, they picked up Westbrook, which things haven't always been great. Westbrook's had some decent individual games, like against the Grizzlies, where he was basically just eating up Dylan Brooks and spitting him out. Um, it was um it's been 
tough. They've dealt with a lot of injuries this year, which I had originally I had Clippers as my first seed provided yeah. that they didn't deal with injuries. And while, as too. you saw, the asterisk kicked in and they they've struggled. Now, this Suns team is fantastic. They haven't lost a game since Kevin Durant has joined the yep, fold and played haven't. on the court and they still haven't. I think that streak will last a little while longer into the series, but eventually the Suns are going to face their first loss with Durant because let's be honest, this Clippers team is still pretty good. They still have pretty good players. I think this series can go to six games, maybe a seventh, but I'm willing to bet that the Phoenix Suns take this one in six. I just think their offense is too potent with Kevin Durant, Chris Paul, and Devin Booker. Um, Their health seems to be better, although for both teams, health is a big question down the stretch. Because all the major players on both teams have dealt with injuries. Absolutely. I think you're going to also see some erratic Westbrook games, maybe late, yes. um, which might cost them. Yes. Um, and the Suns, I feel like they have a bunch. It's a more disciplined group, and I'm willing to bet that that's a major factor. Also, we don't know what Paul George really is going to look like. Um, and If, if we, we can, see him, yeah. If we, we see him, see too, him. which is huge. So um, I'm willing to go Suns and six. Yeah. Yeah. This is, I think this is a bad matchup for the Clippers and I agree with you. You know, it looks like Chris ball might miss most, if not all of the series. And I think going into a series, having Russell Westbrook kind of as your bona fide number two at this point, because when they picked them up, they're like, Oh, you know, he's icing on the cake. You know, he's kind of just, he's not going to be serving in this primary, you know, scoring ball handling role. He's going to be coming off the bench. And now you're going into the series, you're like, okay, Kawhi is our number one. Our number two is Russell Westbrook. And to me, that's a scary situation that you put yourself in at this point in his career. It's a recipe for a disaster. I think he's going to try to play too hard to get back at KD. I know they can say all these things in the media, talk about how there's no beef and how, you know, hey, we're friends, you know, that's in the past, you know, there's nothing personal. I think when you get on that court, Russell Westbrook, I mean, we saw when they played against the Lakers, he was pointing, he was talking to LeBron because he feels personally that LeBron did something against him and, you know, is the reason that he was no longer on the Lakers. But whether that be true or not, I still think when he gets on that court and he's starting to feel himself a little bit, makes a couple nice plays, a couple dunks, he's going to start talking. He's going to get at KD. He's going to make things a little bit personal. And I think he's going to – Well, exactly. He's got history on – it will, on that side of things for the Phoenix Suns, absolutely. I think he's going to have a plethora of untimely turnovers. And with the Suns, who still haven't taken that loss with KD in the lineup, I think they get over the Clippers in six games. I, I think that it could very well be five as well. I think Phoenix is going to be firmly in control of this series. I think Kawhi can try to make things uncomfortable for Durant. But really, the thing with Durant, what kind of gets him a li- I mean, and he's one of the greatest players we've ever seen, so you, you're never going to be able to stop him. But what can kind of shake him a little bit is kind of toughen him up, you know, kind of push him around, bully him a little bit, where like, and, and that can affect him, where Kawhi more has like the length, and that's kind of more what bothers like a LeBron. Like LeBron, you can't push around because he's so strong. He's not going to get pushed around. What bothers LeBron is having that length and that speed in front of him, which is kind of like the Kawhi type of defender. He's more of a lengthy where I think Kawhi is going to try to make things uncomfortable for Durant, but with the height of Durant, he's just going to be able to shoot over the top of everybody in this league. That's what he does. That's what he's been doing for a very long time. I don't think they're going to have an answer. And I think Booker on the wing, I don't think they have a guy that can stay in front of, of Devin Booker either. You know, Chris Paul to me, whatever he gives you is going to be great for the Phoenix Suns. That's what I'm looking at throughout this entire playoff run, but it's going to be KD. Can he stay healthy? Can he stay on the court? And can Devin Booker continue to just keep shooting? Cause that's what he's been doing since KD got there. And it's obviously been working out well. So I'm going with the Phoenix Suns in six games. I would not be surprised if it was five. I would be surprised if it got pushed to seven. Cause I just don't see the, the, uh, the Clippers taking three games in this series. So mm-hmm. I'm right there with, it. we've been, we've been pretty spot on so far for both of our predictions for both of our matchups. I, so I'm interested to see moving forward, but now we got our second match. Disagree a little bit with the, one of the last playing. Games. Yeah, that's, that's, that's you know fine. that's fine. I mean, it's our personal teams yeah. going up against each hey, other. Winner go I mean, home, man. You had a strong second round last year. It'd be completely understandable if you were wrong this time around. <laughs> I mean, you can't hit. You can't be right every time. Man. Hey, we'll see. We'll <laughs> see. We shall see. We were both wrong on obviously Miami against Atlanta, but we'll, so we'll yeah. both wear that one. They just hey, an you were wrong about Chicago and Toronto. I was wrong. Two in a row. I, Why yep. don't you make it two for two? I had also, Toronto on that one. Yeah. Which, by the way, 
little, nice little wrinkle of deer, uh, DeRozan. We're going to need you against Milwaukee. When Giannis <laughs> is up there taking 10 seconds, we're going to need you yeah. to get in his head. We're oh, going to need her. We're going to need her. <laughs> moving, on to game. Our, moving on to our next matchup in the Western Conference. We got those Sacramento Kings against the Golden State Warriors, that three versus that six. Or no, the wait. Did I do that right? Yeah. Yep, three I did versus them, six. Yeah, three versus six. Who you got in that matchup? Um, I have the Golden State Warriors. Congratulations, Sacramento fans. You're back in the playoffs. You have the most expensive playoff tickets in the entire league this year. You outdid, you somehow outdid Silicon Valley's Golden State Warriors. Your tickets are way more expensive than them. Congre- that's an impressive feat. You've been lighting the beam all year. Welcome back to the playoffs for the first time since 2006. I was eight years old and really didn't know too much about your franchise at all. Um, but I have to say this, you're going up against Stephen Curry and the defending champion, Golden State Warriors, who are probably going to get Andrew Wiggins back for this series. You hope, you hope you see that, but even without Wiggins, the Warriors, I think are unquestionably the favorite here. Um, Sacramento has been great all season. Um, the problem is they don't have defense and defense matters in these playoff series, especially against a team with as potent of an offense as Golden State can have when everyone's feeling it, when they have that death lineup in good luck, Steph Curry and Clay Thompson are pr- as consistent as they can come from the outside. And if Jordan Poole is not having a bad Jordan Poole game and he's playing like Jordan Poole that we saw many times in the playoffs last season. They can run up the score real quick if you're not paying attention. This Kings team is well coached, but I don't think they really have a chance here. I think they can maybe take two games, make it a six game series. But in the end, it's going to be Golden State coming out on top. I think the Warriors are going to continue a quest to get back to the finals. I don't think they're the favorite this year. I I would personally have the Suns as the favorite out West. But Golden State's going to make it interesting for whoever they come up against in the playoffs. Never count Steph Curry out. That's all I'm going to say here. Sorry, Sacramento. Thanks for playing. Maybe next. (laughs) Man, I'm so excited for this matchup. Oh, I can't wait. The the Kings breaking that long playoff drought. You know, they're playing and hosting the defending world champion Golden State Warriors in round one. Kings have struggled all season on the defensive end. We've talked about it really from the get-go. But so have the Warriors, you know, and the Warriors, they are 11 and 30 this season on the road. The Kings have been nearly the same team, both home and away. I think all these games, they're going to be high scoring shootouts. I don't think there's going to be a lot of defense being played on on either side, to be honest. The Kings obviously have that historic offense this this season. I look at the Warriors, they're going to be playing really dependent on Gary Payton. We've heard a lot about him and, you know, his he's kind of been ramping up to get back up to regular minutes. And Wiggins, we'll see how he is coming back off of that long, you know, absence. I I think a lot of the times a long absence, as long as you're still in shape and as long as you're still, it'll take a little bit to get into playing shape and get a little bit, you know, conditioning. I think the defensive side comes back a lot easier than the offensive side to kind of get more Mm -hmm. in rhythm when you don't necessarily have the ball in your hand. That can kind of be, you know, kind of a silver lining for him to work his way back. But I think when you're relying on both those guys, you know, they're, they're going to be asking them to play big minutes on the defensive end. Obviously, you know what you can do on the offensive side with Steph Curry and Klay Thompson. Klay Thompson, he's been great. We haven't talked about him enough uh, coming back off of his injury. It's looked really good. He's obviously not the defender he once was. But on the offensive side, that man can still light up, light up the scoreboard. So I think the Warriors are going to continue to struggle on the road. I think the Kings crowd is going to be roaring. Beams are going to be being lit. Kings are taking down the defending champions in Whoa. seven games in round one. Kings are getting the win. Game seven at home. Beams are being lit like that damn beam and knocking out the Warriors in round one. Hey, I would be open to seeing the series go to seven like that. I feel like it'd be fun, but uh, we'll see. We'll see uh, who lucks out here with their prediction. Like that damn beam. And another thing I didn't mention, too, they're going to have the clutch player of the year. So in these games, when they get down – to those kind of last few minutes, DeAndre or DeAndre, De'Aaron Fox has been playing that way this entire season. He is frustrating and it has been for me when I have placed bets. He has been historically great in the clutch. He has been fantastic. I know Steph Curry. He's a very clutch player as well. He's obviously he's been there. He's done that. I am not doubting Steph Curry in the slightest. 
I'm doubting. Never doubt Steph Curry. I'm doubting Jordan Poole getting the ball over Steph Curry and saying it's my time. It's my time and doing something stupid and Steph Curry throwing his mouthpiece again, being so frustrated at his young guard. So I'm going with the Sacramento Kings. I'm going with the beam. I'm going with those Kentucky boys with Malik Monk and De'Aaron Fox. I'm going with Demona Sabonis, going with Mike Brown and Harrison Barnes get his revenge for being the odd man out from that first, you know, Golden State Warriors group being the one that that wasn't going to get paid and being sent out of town. That's a nice little wrinkle right there. Absolutely. About Harrison, that. Harrison Barnes. I know it's been a long time since he was a Golden State Warrior, but he was the original. He was that original power forward, that original guy, original wing there. So I'm excited for this matchup, and I'm going with the upset. I know it's it's weird to say an upset when you're picking the two over the seven, but I think you look at the betting odds, I'm pretty sure the Warriors are the favorite in that series. I'm going with the upset. Give me Sacramento and give me that beam. I'm so excited. So excited. Moving on to our next series in the Western Conference, and that is the Memphis Grizzlies, that number two seed, taking on that seventh seed, Los Angeles Lakers. It's been a long season for the Lakers. They're locked into that seventh seed now. They have the Grizzlies. What you got going on in that series? Uh, I was hoping this would be the series we'd see. I didn't want to see another Minnesota Grizzlies series because I knew <laughs> Minnesota was just going to screw it up because yeah. – and we saw that game. Minnesota led the whole way. At one Absolutely. point, I think they're up to by close to 20. And it looked like the Lakers were going to have to find another way to get into the playoffs. Yep. And no, Minnesota did them favors. They went away from their offense. And we saw how this series went last year with the Grizzlies in Minnesota. Where yep. Minnesota should have won that series in like five or six games. Just and gave they gave it, it every single time. It was yep. mind boggling. I don't want to see that kind of basketball again. I want to <laughs> give me something new. I want to see LeBron James back in the first round yeah. playing against the Grizzlies, a team that LeBron's had a little beef in the past, as we saw last season, like where yeah. he was yelling at them, like, you guys haven't done anything. They haven't like, done anything. Like, He's still right on that. They still haven't done anything. Yes. Now's their chance, but they still have not done anything to this point. If the Grizzlies want to earn some stripes, this is the series to do it. You're Absolutely. going against one of the greatest players in sports history. Absolutely. Let alone one of the greatest in basketball. Yeah. If you want to earn your stripes, you do it by taking out the king. That's how you do it. Absolutely. However, it's not going to be that simple. You're going against LeBron James, who despite taking some plays off on defense, is still one of the most effective players this game has today as you saw in their comeback against minnesota he was making plays feeding mm -hmm. the right players making guy sure guys were open drawing away the defense i mean that's how dennis Schroeder was able to get that wide open three to Absolutely. what we thought was going to be should the have been winner. the game winner yeah but uh and then anthony davis messed yeah, up a little bit plans. and mike conley decided to be the most clutch man on the planet at the that free takes, throw line. that, that takes balls, that's man. some veins of steel shout out mike conley all three Ooh. Yeah, and honestly, I I have to say this. I think the Lakers messed up not making sure Mike Conley was in that trade. I rather would have had Mike Conley than D'Lo. Um, D'Lo makes more sense in the long term, but yeah. I think Mike Conley is just a better fit. Anyway, um, be. the Lakers have been tied with the Grizzlies for the best record in the NBA since the trade deadline, um, and that shouldn't go unnoticed. This team is completely different from the two and ten team we saw. They Absolutely. actually have weapons beyond LeBron James and Anthony Davis. <laughs> um, yeah. The main concern is going to be: Can Anthony Davis and LeBron James stay healthy and just give a hundred percent energy yeah. on a, a night to night basis? As we know, that's been a struggle at times this year. We even saw Davis holding his shoulder during the game against the Timberwolves. Yep. So, what's his health going to look like game to game, especially against a tough physical team like the Grizzlies, who he may get banged up a little bit? We don't know. Um, however, I think this is another situation where the lower seeded team is going to be the team to beat here. Oh, I think the Lakers, yeah, LeBron James is moving past the first round for the first time since yep. the bubble, since since they won the chip. Yeah, yep. absolutely. They're going to be going to the second round. I see this series going to probably six or seven games, mm -hmm. given the Lakers health issues or just potential burnout on a nightly basis. I'm going to, I'm going to stamp it down as a seven game series. Okay. I can't wait for the series. It's, um, it's going to be crazy. I, I can't wait. This is, this is the series I'm looking forward to. The yeah. Most. Yeah. This, this matchup is going to be super interesting. I think in an ideal world where you're kind of just lining teams up and you're picking opponents, I think the Lakers would have rather played Denver in round one to just kind of, you know, 
obviously you're going to be taking on a top scene anyways, but I, they're going out there getting that win. You don't want to deal with, with the second game of a play in and have to, you know, if you win, you're, you're the eight seed. And if you lose, you go home. If you got a chance to win and get to that seven where you kind of have that game as a backup, you, you, you try to win that game. Like, I don't care if you'd rather face Denver over Memphis. However, this is, it's a very winnable series for the Lakers. And one thing, if they're able to take them out in round one, that's one of the biggest, if, if, you're in the Lakers locker room and obviously your goal is to win a championship, whether you, whether outside the locker room, you feel like you can do it or not. You want to take out, if you could take out the, the Memphis Grizzlies, that's one of your biggest competition early on. And especially if you're mm-hmm. talking about a lot of these top seeds could get upset by these bottom seeds in the Western conference, how things are lined up this year. We just talked about the, you know, the warriors going up against Sacramento, Sacramento being the three seed, the warriors being the seven or being the six seed where this is it's going to be interesting to see if these guys get knocked out. This is going to have to be an Anthony Davis series if they're going to win. I think John Morant, you can kind of just pencil in. He's going to get 30 to 35 points. He's going to be great. He he is great. He's one of the best up and coming players in this league. I don't even know if we could say up and coming at this point because he's he's here. He's arrived. Mm-hmm. He is great. He's going to be just fine. You can live with 30 points from John Morant. I think the key is Jaron Jackson Jr. against Anthony Davis. And Triple J, he's great, but there is a reason in his career that he only plays about 20 minutes a game. He's prone to fouls. He gets in a lot of foul troubles. That's what he does. Same thing with Carl Anthony Towns that we just saw in the playing game. Carl Anthony Towns was dominating that game, looked great, got in foul trouble, left the game. When he came back, he was never the same player. He was not as effective coming back into the game. Jaron Jackson Jr. plays about 28 minutes a game in his career, and the reason why he does that is he gets in foul trouble. I think Anthony Davis can exploit that. I think he can get them into trouble, and without Steven Adams, who I think they announced he's out for the season, like I don't think they expect him back at all, especially not in the first round. They don't have a lot of big man depth outside of Jaron Jackson Jr. Lakers are going to try to have, you know, Dylan Brooks guard LeBron as much as possible. I think that that's kind of, there's twofold to that. Obviously, I think Dylan Brooks thinks that he's probably a better defender than he actually is. I think LeBron can still do do what he wants on the offensive side. But also, I think they could try to defend him, you know, have LeBron defend Dylan Brooks the way that they kind of said they were going to defend Russell Westbrook, where we're going to leave him open. The problem is Dylan Brooks, sometimes he can get really streaky from beyond the three-point line. He can knock down a bunch of big shots. I think you can live with that if Dylan Brooks is knocking down open shots, but I think it also allows LeBron to kind of take a little bit more off on the defensive side, save that energy for the offensive side, and just kind of maybe feed into the Dylan Brooks, trying to get, you know, make him a little bit too big for his britches, give him a big ego, think that he's taken over this series type thing, could work into their favor. I think the X factor is going to be the performance of Desmond Bain, what he does in that backcourt. He's he's a great player in this league. And what I like about Desmond, where it seems like there's all this talk going on around him, he's a very seems very quiet, very reserved, just well respected, well liked type of player. Just goes out there and does his business. So it's going to be interesting to see. You know, I think Austin Reeves is going to be on him a lot out there on the defensive end to see kind of if Austin Reeves can keep up with Desmond Bain and um all that being said, all the factors going into this game, I'm going to say give me the Lakers to pull off this upset. I'm going to give them six games. I think they win it in that game six, advance to round two, take out the Grizzlies, just because I think Jaron Jackson Jr., who everybody talks about, could win defensive player of the year. I don't know how much we'll actually see him out there. And the Lakers, everybody wants to talk about the free throw disparity. The reason why they get so many free throws is because they drive to the basket because they are not a good jump shooting team. So when you drive to the basket a lot, there's going to be a lot of contact. You're going to get a lot more calls. I think Anthony Davis, the focus early on in those games should be feed AD down low, try to get those first two or three fouls against Jaron Jackson Jr., and then take the game from there. Let John Moran, he's going to get his you know, out there on the perimeter, he's going to be driving to to the lane. Have to defend him without fouling because obviously you got to keep AD. AD doesn't get in a lot of foul trouble for for being you know being down there so much and the way he defends, you know, protecting the rim. It doesn't seem like he's in foul trouble a lot. Jaron Jackson Jr. has not learned how to defend without fouling, so that's going to be key in this series. Yeah, and I think that's going to be something the Lakers are easily going to exploit if Jaron Jackson does get up there. LeBron yeah. is one of the smartest players in the league. Once he sees JJJ get into some foul trouble, he's go gonna at go at him or tell his teammates go at him. Go That's at gonna, him. I mean, you saw they did the same thing to Towns the other night, and it worked. Which was key. 
Yeah, because Towns was seen with five fouls through yep. overtime in the last few minutes of the fourth quarter, and he was just giving up buckets because he do- he does not know how to play with and fouls. The first two in almost three quarters, he was the best player on the floor. Yes, he, he was unstoppable. Cat was mm-hmm. he was unstoppable. Took him out of the game, and that's exactly what I think they're going to be doing with Jaron Jackson. I agree with you. Attack yeah. him. So, I can't wait. No, it's it's going to be an incredible series. Grizzlies versus Lakers. We both had the Lakers pulling off the upset. Oh, it's been a long season for the Lakers, man. I just I want them to make a run. Obviously, I'd like to see LeBron get as far as he possibly can. I just don't know how much they have left in the tank, man. I they've they've essentially been playing playoff basketball for the last month. So I just you know you never yeah. know when that's going to run well, out. But put putting on my biased fan hat, I hope both teams <laughs> lose. I hope if it, there's hope, a way, I hope both teams uh, lose this series oh, and then man. somebody gets a second round buy. <laughs> that would be a dream scenario for me, but uh, I'm, someone has to win. Someone's got to uh, win. So, yeah, but if both teams win. Moving on to our last matchup over in the Western Conference. That is that first seed Denver Nuggets taking on the winner of the final play-in game. That'll be the Timberwolves against the Oklahoma City Thunder. So who do you got taking the playoff win and then who you got taking that series? So that game against the uh, the Pelicans was exciting, Thunder yeah. versus Pelicans. And the Thunder put up a pretty good fight. It was close the entire game. One team would go up, the other team would go up. It was a little back and forth. Um, and obviously the Thunder won out in the end. Uh, Shea Gilgis-Alexander is one of the most dynamic players That's we great. have in today's game. He's yeah. fantastic. I, I don't think anyone thought he would be as good as he's been this no. past season. Um, he's definitely going to get some... MIP votes for sure. He's not going to win it, but he's definitely going to get some votes and well deserved, of course, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but in this series, the Thunder they're they're still too young. Um, they don't have players that can perform on a consistent basis. Where as you get to the Denver Nuggets, they're a pretty well oiled machine. Not a lot of stars on this team beyond Nikola Jokic, of course, but there are, are a bunch of really great role players around him that know their roles and definitely make Jokic the well-rounded player that he is. Um, You have Michael Porter Jr., you have Jamal Murray, you have Aaron Gordon. um, Perfect players to put around Jokic. They've been fantastic this season. I mean, we've seen Aaron Gordon put up like the best season of his career to where he thought he was deserving some all-star votes. I don't know about that, but Aaron Gordon, you're pretty good. Um, He's been great. This is the first time in a while we've seen a completely healthy Nuggets team in the playoffs. I think the first time since the bubble, maybe they've been completely healthy because yeah, yeah. Jamal Murray missed the last two playoff series. Michael Porter Jr. wasn't available last season, and the Nuggets went through a few personnel changes that saw Aaron Gordon come into the fold. Now that all these guys have a full season under their belts of playing together, I think we're going to see a much more, um, a much more confident Nuggets team than we saw last year against Golden State. I'm expecting this to be an interesting series um, because we get to see Shea and this new look Thunder for the first time since the Supersonics um, without having Durant or Westbrook in a playoff series. This is going to be the first time since they were the Supersonics, which bring back the Sonics, by the way. Um, (laughs) But I I, I don't think they're going to be much of a challenge to this Nuggets team. I think this could be probably a five-game series. I think they'll steal one game, but I'm going to pencil it in for five. I just think Jokic, who's been an was at one time the MVP favorite for a large portion of the season, it's just he he does so much. I don't think the Thunder really have a guy to match up against it. Yeah, Yeah, I'm right there with you as far as the plan. In the interest of fun, I want to see the Thunder make it to that seven-game series. The, The Timberwolves, it's just like, you look at them; it doesn't look like they play inspiring basketball. Like it, they're they're not a good watch. And I know, like when you're talking about these bottom tier teams, the guys that are going to get you know run out in the first round, anyways. I want to see exciting. I want to see young. I would love to see this Oklahoma City Thunder team. Who obviously, you know, they had a top pick in this last draft. Drafted, you know, Chet. He was hurt, didn't play at all this season. Have so many draft picks going forward. Have a chance. They have Shea, who I think is a true superstar in this league. Mm-hmm. They got a chance to build around him. They they got a great guy in that front office and Sam Presti. I want to see them make the playoffs. I want to see them yeah. just kind of get a little taste. You know, see what playoff basketball is all about. I think the Timberwolves, they've run its course. I think it's going to be a Nuggets versus Thunder series. I could see things getting interesting in that series. Uh, Nuggets, they've obviously they've earned that number one seed. 
But I think they've also been disrespected kind of by the national media and other teams in the West talking about, hey, you know, if you could pick a team to play, you probably want it to be Denver because you, you could upset Denver. I don't think the Nuggets have a guy to match up with SGA. I don't think the, the Nuggets have someone that can stay in front of him. But I also don't think that the Thunder have a big man that can stay anywhere in front of uh, Nikola Jokic. I think, you know, Jalen Williams, the, the one of the Jalen Williams is – he plays pretty well down, but he's so young. He's only like 20 years old. I know he plays tough on the defensive end where he takes a lot of charges. He plays, you know, he's full of energy. I, I like him moving forward. I just think Jokic, he's been around the block. He's been in this league. He's won MVPs. He's going to be able to just pick apart that defense and just kind of orchestrate the offense around him. And it's not necessarily going to be him just dominating down there on the block. He's just – they're going to do what they've done all season. He's going to be basically the point guard leading things through. And I think Joker running that offense, they're going to be able to take this series. I will give the young scrappy Thunder two games, though. Um, I'll say the Nuggets get it done in game six. So I'll give the Thunder two games in this series, but – Nuggets get it done in six games. Yeah. By the way, we have a little bit of breaking news in the end. Oh, what we got? A team we have not mentioned for reasons as in they didn't make the playoffs, shockingly. The Dallas Mavericks, according to Sham Sharania, has been fined $750,000 oh, man. for resting players versus the Chicago Bulls. That's that's a pretty big fine. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know what the NBA could get away with in terms of uh, punishment. Like, I don't think you can whole draft capital for something like that. Yeah. Um, although that'd be ironic. Because um, they did it to try to keep that first round pick because it was a top 10 protected. Yeah. But um, uh, that's a huge fine. That's that's a lot of money. Um, that's, man. that's a big chunk of change. But I think Mark Cuban's like the most fined owner. Um, <laughs> yeah, that does. In like me. the NBA uh, since he's me. been the owner. So, uh, yeah, that's that's not great for the Mavericks. No. But, I mean, we knew something was going to come down the pipeline. You don't put Luca into a game for one quarter and then pull him the rest of the game. Like, well, they, and they announced it before, which was weird. Like, yeah. I, I feel like if you're going to do that, the easy way to get around it, you shouldn't be advocating for people to to lie. But like, it seems like it'd be easy for a team to put someone in for the first quarter and then say, "Oh, he had a tight hamstring." And we yeah. didn't play him there. Like, it's like, no one really questions that, you know, it's like, it's kind of like, oh, you know, he had some tightness or heck he was cramping something like it doesn't have to be like this big injury, but no, that is interesting to see the fine come down. So they violated player resting policy in the elimination game versus bulls to try to keep first round pick. So, yeah, that's interesting. We are. I mean, obviously we talked about the CBA in the last game or in the last podcast where, um, obviously they're trying to do what they can to get rid of, of tanking, to get rid of, you know, this, this load management and do what they can to incentivize those, those players to play as many games as possible. And it's, it, it's probably, it's a conversation for a different day on the, on the Dallas uh, Mavericks, but there's, there's things brewing over there that, that are definitely going to be interesting going forward into next season and seeing how things play out with Luca there. But that's just another Another wrinkle to throw into that whole conversation there. I'm sure we'll be talking a lot more about the Mavericks this offseason. Yeah, I'm sure we – I mean, it's – a lot of people had the Mavericks going on another deep run. I mean, they made the conference finals last year. You added Kyrie. I wasn't huge on that move, but went out there and they they went for it and dropped completely out of it. But that's interesting, man. But we got to move on here to our last topic on the TM Up podcast. That is, of course, TM Up. So we got a technical foul to throw out before the playoffs actually kick off tomorrow. So who you, who is getting your technical foul? Well, I'm going to have to take it back to Tuesday night for okay. my technical foul. Um, that Bulls-Raptors game, it was getting out of hand quick. Um, we were down 19 points at one point. It was not looking good. Yep. DeMar DeRozan was tearing up towels on the bench. Yep. And it seemed like the officials were... We're doing everything they could to make sure Toronto's getting the extra calls. Seemed like, hmm, maybe the only international team in the league season was on the line or something like that. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, um, yeah, there were a lot of questionable calls that was going Toronto's way. Um, some were fair, um, but then there's a, a few that didn't make much sense. Or Zach Levine getting called for a foul when Pascal Sh- Siakam shoved him across the court um on a, a layup attempt which was bonkers to me um but then it came down into the final minutes where the bulls had finally pulled ahead for like the first time all game and there we were up i think three points at this point like maybe a minute 30 to go and caruso's guarding pascal siak um on the perimeter and then caruso jumped up in the air and kind of came down on siakam 
but Siakam was not in a shooting motion. No, nowhere close. The, and then Caruso comes down, makes contact, and is actually back on the ground, still kind of in contact with Siakam. And then Siakam does the hey, let's try uh let's try a little Trey Young move here and throws up a crazy shot in an attempt to draw a foul. Um and then the refs call the foul. It was a foul, yes, it's a foul. But then they deliberated for a bit. And they deliberated. And then they came to the conclusion, you know what? Three shots for Toronto. I'm sorry, what? You thought that was a shooting foul? It was the most, like, you had time to discuss it. You had time to determine what the call was. What the correct call? You gave yourself that opportunity. And instead, you're like, you know what? Let's give Toronto a chance. Let's send them to the line when they're down three with three shots that they don't deserve. And you know what? Ball does not lie, (laughs) NBA officials. The ball does not lie. I'm invoking the right of Rasheed Wallace in this court. (laughs) Rasheed Wallace. DR DeRozan, the hero, the real MVP, (laughs) screaming at the top of her lungs. She's not going to be there tonight, though. We don't need her. We're not worried about she, they, you just said she's the hero and the real MVP. We don't need her. No, it's we'll fine. Watch. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. Patrick Beverly hates the Miami Heat. We'll have plenty of why because they drafted him. They drafted, they drafted him, way, him way and then when. they abandoned him. Well, yeah, they yeah. abandoned him. They're just like every other team. Yeah. What was it so, like three he, three teams in the last twelve months have abandoned him? So, hey, all I'm saying is uh, we we have enough fuel for the fire. We have enough fuel to beat the oh, Heat. Oh man. Anyway. Um, Pascal Siakam went on to prove everyone and what everyone knew on Twitter in the building who was watching the game. Even the Toronto fans were probably like, Ooh, we'll take it. Um, he missed two out of three free throws to stay on brand with uh Toronto shooting 50% from the line. The Bulls end up winning the game as they should have. But regardless, don't try to take my Bulls playoff aspirations away from me. I'm teeing up the NBA officials. Yeah, save that for Miami. Uh, my technical foul this week is going to the Minnesota Timberwolves franchise. Uh, last offseason, they made the move that they thought was going to push them over the edge when they went out and got Rudy Gobert, Rudy Gobert sent away multiple draft picks, multiple players, including Jared Vanderbilt, Malik Beasley. And I know it wasn't the same move, but at this trade deadline, also sent away D'Angelo Russell, who are now all on the Lakers, who just beat you to send you to a winner go home game against the Thunder. You have players punching walls, so you got players punching other players, and your head coach after the game in you know what I a lot I, we see a lot of head coaches talking after games, obviously, a lot of these press conferences. And I think overall head coaches are very smart individuals. They know how to manage, they know how to do their job, and they don't really they're, they're not pot stirrers for the most part. Obviously, sometimes when it's high pressure situations, it's playoffs, they can say things they probably regret, you know, saying moving forward, just as all of us would. It's 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 high pressure situations. But after the game, you have your head coach giving one of the worst press conferences I've ever seen, talking about how in that game you believe the three the free throw disparity was the reason why you lost that game. In an overtime loss where you led the majority of the game, the Lakers shot just nine more free throws than you. Okay, we're not talking like, oh, they shot 30, you know, and we shot six. This is not like this is not a three a free throw disparity conversation. You gave that game away. Like you were in complete control of that game. The Lakers, I, you were out coached by Darvin Ham in that scenario. Like in that situation, Darvin Ham kept his team together. They continued to attack Carl Anthony Towns, got him in foul trouble, got him out of the game because he was dominating and unstoppable on the offensive end. Lakers are not a jump shooting team. They continue to drive to the basket. That's what they do. They get free throws. They've done it all season. People could talk about a friendly whistle. You know, they're, they're the Lakers. They're going to get calls. That's fine. But at the end of the day, if you watch them and you watch them compared to other teams, other teams take a lot of jump shots. When you take a lot of jump shots, there's not as many fouls called on that because you're just going up from three. You're going up from mid range. Lakers, they drive. Their two best players are taking most of their shots layups. They're, they're driving to the basket. You're going to get more foul calls. This move in comparison to this entire season, it's going to go down as one of the worst in NBA history. It's a failure regardless of regardless of if you get into the playoffs or not. You shot your own team in the foot, and sooner, sooner rather than later, 
We're going to be talking about how the Timberwolves, they're, they're going to be going on a fire sale, hitting that hard reset, technical foul in that front office, because I think this is malpractice, did a terrible job on that Rudy Gobert trade. Who would have – we were all saying, so you're going to take a – oh, they're like, oh, but he's been defensive player of the year. Yeah, but what he saves you on the defensive end, he basically – doesn't give you on the offensive end where the backup would be giving you more on the offensive end. So he kind of negates his effect offense and defense. And then you're going to, you're, you're, I mean, I love Anthony Edwards, but you're like best player, Carl Anthony Towns. They're basically playing the same position. Then you're moving Carl Anthony Towns, who I know he's a great shooter. He's been a great shooter all season. You're going to move him even further away. It just didn't make sense to build a team. It was a terrible move, gave up way too much. And we've seen these teams are like, Yeah, you know, there's teams that are trying to negotiate trades for these superstars, and they're like, well, look what, you know, Rudy, they gave up for Rudy Gobert, and everybody around the league's like, yeah, because they're dumb. That was a terrible move. We're not doing that. Like, sorry. I know, you know, for whatever superstar that you're trying to trade, you know, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, nope, because we're not Minnesota. So that's why we're not giving that up. Just terrible (laughs) move overall by the Minnesota Timberwolves. Just an awful trade. It, one of the worst in NBA history. Makes me glad the boys, the, the Bulls avoided trading for him, honestly. Oh, man, just a terrible move. And they're going to be the effects. I mean, we still talk about the, the Boston and, and Brooklyn Nets trade. Like, we're, we still talk about that trade. This one could very well be worse. Oh, it's it's terrible. They're, they're lucky they have awful. Anthony Edwards, honestly. They're lucky. For, for how much longer? Because well, Anthony yeah, Edwards at some point, I, I'm just saying, like, I think – Rudy Gobert, it, it he's one of those guys. It just seems like no one enjoys playing with him. I, I'm, I'm sorry. He's just one of those guys. It seems like no one really enjoys it. Kyle Anderson definitely doesn't enjoy playing with him. I'll tell you that much. Donovan Mitchell didn't enjoy playing with him. So it's, no. it's, it's a terrible move. They're getting my technical foul. I'm just giving it to the whole Minnesota Timberwolves front office. Well deserved. Absolutely. And I hope they get knocked out by, <laughs> by the Thunder. The Thunder, they're fun. They play fun basketball. Shea Gildas Alexander. I do not want to watch Denver versus Minnesota in a seven game series. Yeah. I would much rather see Oklahoma City just trying their hardest, all 20 year olds out there just trying to beat the Joker. Did you notice how I didn't even bring up Minnesota? Didn't even because that? we're on I the same even, page. Because I'm, I'm oh, done man. talking about Minnesota. They're the most infuriating team. Let's to watch. go Thunder. Let's, Let's go, go Thunder, Thunder, man. And I don't like the Thunder. Me at neither. All. As a franchise, they're not exciting. the players. They're fun players are fine. Fine with yeah. the players. I just don't like the thunder out of the principle that bring back the Super Sonics. I got That's you. That's all. I got you. <laughs> Thank you guys all for watching uh, this edition of the TMO podcast, breaking down all of our playoff matchups. Uh, it's been a lot of fun going through this season, and we're getting ready for playoffs, man. So playoffs, we're talking about playoffs? Playoffs? Yeah. Not a game. Not a game. I know. I, I just mixed up the two of them, but that's fine. Either way. I, I'm all guys, for it. Thank you guys all for listening along and following along on all of our social media platforms for fun NBA content throughout the week. We'll be enjoying playoff basketball. We'll catch you guys with the next edition when we circle right back around. But that's all we have this time. Thanks you all for listening. We'll catch you guys next time. And remember, beat the heat. No, absolutely not. <laughs>